Oh yes, now that everybody's lost interest in this new platform launch, now is my time to shine. And what better way to use a new product that people have already stopped caring about than use it in the least practical way possible. Ecore Gaming, hell yeah. Today's video is sponsored by Linode. Linode! Linode. Linode is a Linux-based web hosting service which, according to G2, is the easiest infrastructure as service provider to use. Linode offers a wide variety of products, including web hosting, game server hosting, they can handle any computational load you throw at them. Linode also offers Kubernetes solutions using K8s with horizontal cluster auto-scaling. Whoa! That sounds very fancy. In other news, Linode also recently upgraded their block storage volumes with NVMe drives, which means you can get a huge speed upgrade at no extra cost. If Linode sounds good to you, use the link in my description below to sign up for a 60-day $100 free credit. Now for those of you that are a bit unclear as to what the E-Cores are that we're going to be gaming with today, here is a very helpful diagram of the die of the CPU in the Intel Press packaging circa Corsair. So <laughs> thank you Corsair for sending over these CPUs. Uh, now basically, this CPU has two types of cores. It's got these huge Chad gaming cores over here, which are the performance cores. You can see they're big, chunky monster beasts. Each one of these is nice and fast. It's a modern, powerful CPU core. And when you move down to over here, you can see we've got these little baby cores. Four of them take up about as much space as one Chad core. These are the ones that kick in when you just need a lot of cores with a productivity use case or whatever. And this is what we're going to game with today. So we're going to switch off all the Chad cores and we're just going to be using little baby cores. <laughs> I was lucky enough to get sent two of these CPUs. So we have an i9-12900K, which is like the big boy CPU in the lineup. And then we also have an i5-12600K. And I actually think I'm gonna be using that CPU for this video because this has four efficiency cores. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how this new i5's efficiency core section compares to an old i5 that just had four cores. I think that'll be a really interesting comparison. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this one today. Now in terms of the motherboard, we're gonna use this ROG Strix Z690 board, which costs $400. I thought that the Strix boards were supposed to be like fully featured value-ish gaming motherboards. $400 is a lot for one of these. Although this very expensive motherboard was very kindly sent out by Micro Center. Micro Center, the place where nerds dreams come true. The right choice. Oh wow, that is a really awesome looking motherboard actually. It reminds me more of like a like a formula board than a Strix board. Uh, so it may be very expensive, but it, it is hella featured. You've even got like a little... Look at that, it's got like a little, little strap on it for some reason. What is this for? Why? And then the final bit of new hardware that I just want to go at is this kit of RAM sent over by Corsair. Thank you very much. It's 64 gigs of DDR5 and it's Dom Platts, which, you know, that's like the best RAM. So this is, this is awesome. I can't wait to get this up and running. This is like if a B2 stealth bomber was a RAM kit. Oh. Now this is actually a really cool feature. It's a button up here that releases the PCIe slot like clip because bigger graphics cards often make it really difficult to get to that. And now you've just got a button up here you can press. That's awesome. Wouldn't pay $400 for that button, but still it is, it's cool that it's there. Okay, so this is a little bit embarrassing, but I don't actually have a cooler that can mount to this CPU socket yet. Um, so I'm gonna have to get a little bit creative about how I mount this deep cool cooler to the, to the 12600K. Luckily, Asus very conveniently provides a little baggie of zip ties with this Z690 Strix board. I'm assuming for this exact use case.
Wait, actually, it seems like this cooler is big and heavy enough for it to create decent thermal contact just with gravity. So I'm going to try it out like this before I actually zip tie it down uh, because I think this should be okay. And the zip tie situation down there is a little bit sketchy. So going to drop in a fan there and then see. Maybe, maybe it's okay without the zip ties. Now for tests like this, you always want a nice baseline. So here we have the CPU just stock running the way that Intel intended. I don't think I've ever seen sustained frame rates this high at 1080p ultra settings with Battlefield 5, even with the 3080 Ti like we're running here. Although it is a little bit stuttery, but that could be due to the fact that we're using DirectX 12. On a side note, those CPU temperatures are amazing, and it's just proof again that mounting hardware is for losers. Anyway, let's have a look at a couple more games to see how this platform performs. Oh, there, oh damn it, there's always seven more than you expect. So now that we have a baseline, we need to figure out how to switch off those pesky CHAD cores to get to the real gaming performance hidden in these 12th gen i5s. Um, now, I did go into the BIOS of our super fancy Strix board, and while you do have the option to switch off some of the P cores, you can't switch off all of them. The minimum you can have running at a time is one, uh, which is one more than we want. Luckily, Der Bauer did actually beat me to this video, and considering that he is a very smart legend person, uh, he figured it out really easily. So thank you very much, Der Bauer, for showing me the light of Process Lasso, which is a pretty cool bit of software. If you want to see somebody that actually knows what they're talking about on this topic, I'd definitely go check out his video. I'll link it in the description below. Now, basically how Process Lasso works is you can dictate which threads a specific process uh, gets access to, and then you can just switch off all of the P cores and tell Process Lasso to only allow E cores to run the video game. And it works. It works very well. So with that, I switched off all the P cores so that we can see what happens with Battlefield 5 using four E cores. Whoa, would you look at that? It's, it's pretty impressive, right? This They're not supposed to be doing what we're doing with them here. And it's entirely usable. Okay, I, I don't think I don't think the RTX 3080 Ti would say that this is a usable experience going on here, because uh, it is not doing a whole lot. But okay, look at that! You can play some Battlefield 5 using E cores. That's that's exciting. Now, while the multiplayer gaming experience was surprisingly impressive, uh, the moment that I loaded up my single-player benchmark run things didn't go as well. The game would freeze up for a solid couple seconds every now and then, which was not great for the 1% lows. Apparently, Battlefield 5 single player does not like E-Cores very much. Now, moving over to GTA 5, this is where it got quite embarrassing for the Chad cores, to be honest, because the average frame rate may be much lower with the E cores, but the 1% low is significantly higher, and it means that subjectively, the game actually felt more just stable and less stuttery with just the E cores running, which is pretty wild. Although, I will say that um, I could only run the benchmark once. That, that was all I could do. After I ran that benchmark once, I couldn't load into the game or anything. It would just crash in the loading screen every time. So, yeah, GTA 5 also didn't really seem to like the E-Cores very much, aside from that one time the game ran pretty well on it. But in terms of CSGO and Doom Eternal, the average frame rate was quite a lot lower than the P-Cores, but it was a very, just surprisingly good showing. But anyway, now I think we need to put this E-Core performance into perspective. And I think the best way to do that is to compare these four E-Cores to an old i5 that also only had four cores in them. So I'm going to be comparing it to the i5 4690K, which I had in the Craigslist PC in my previous video. It seems surprisingly close. Um... That, that RTX 3080 Ti is so confused, it's basically never been run in a system that makes sense. And then today it's like the first system that makes sense and now I've immediately taken that away from it. But anyway, what we saw with the E-Core setup was that in multiplayer it was actually okay, but when we did the actual benchmarks, that's when, well, that's when it kind of wet the bed. So yeah, let's see what happens with the, the, the full-fledged i5. Wow, 
wow, okay, those E-cores are, are really impressive. Bear in mind, you know, in this comparison, the, the old i5 was using 16 gigs of DDR3 1600 megahertz, as opposed to 64 gigs of DDR5 running at 5200 megahertz. The extra capacity didn't really help, because none of the games used more than like 12 gigs, uh, but the extra memory bandwidth definitely would have helped. Anyway, even taking that into account, I think that the E-Cores are surprisingly impressive. Yeah, if you wanted to, you could switch your P-Cores off and have a reasonable gaming experience. Maybe even a more stable gaming experience in some, some situations, which is pretty weird. Yeah, that 12600K did seem to have some frame pacing issues in my tests. Uh, but anyway, with that, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do like and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this one. And until the next video, bye-bye.